good evening and welcome back to this session on uh, developing high impact journal publications so we often wonder what journal editors are looking when accepting manuscripts typical reasons as to why manus manuscripts are rejected and importance of impact and how impacts on our study can be emphasized in different parts of the paper welcome to the session developing high impact journal publications in which the, all the above questions will be answered let me introduce the guest speaker for the session paul w chan joined the faculty of architecture and the built environment at delft university technology in march 2019 as a professor of design and construction management since his phd study on construction labor productivity at harriet watt university in edinburgh paul has developed a track record in studying how people cope with organizational social and technology technological change he has managed a number of funded research projects in this regard his editor in chief of construction management and economics and a former chair of the association of researchers in construction management he has authored and co-authored over 100 peer reviewed journal and conference articles he also co-authored constructing future 2010 a wiley black well book on leadership and future thinking in construction industry before moving forward i would like to invite all of you to pop your questions uh, using the q and a feature of zoom uh, so we can read out read them out at the end and now i would like to invite professor paul chan to carry out the session on high impact articles and journal publications thank you thank you kalindu for the uh, uh, nice introduction so um, good evening everyone uh, it's uh, 12 noon in the netherlands so I think it's about uh, half past four or something like that in um, in where you are. Um, so I shall just uh, carry on with uh, my presentation, um, and I really want to focus on uh, some of the key points uh, to bear in mind when you are developing articles that you are intending to publish in uh, high impact uh, outlets. Uh, so as Kalindu uh, explained, I'm also the editor in chief. Uh, of construction management and economics I'll say something about the journal uh it's, it's a Taylor and Francis journal uh so uh that's the scope of my presentation I also want to uh, focus a bit about the impact agenda and why that is really quite important and also to start thinking about uh, uh how we can actually demonstrate the impacts uh in our article uh so to do that I'm going to share with you also some ideas about the logic of the research article uh, so that you can also uh, identify how and where to focus on in terms of clarifying communicating and convincing others about the impacts of your contribution uh, of course there's going to be time i hope at the end uh, for the q and a uh, and i'm also kind of uh, looking forward to the questions that you have uh, put uh, put in the chat Uh, so this is just a brief background about the journal. Uh, this is taken from the aims and scope of construction management and economics, which you can find uh, on the website. Uh, and I understand also that we have uh, colleagues here from multiple disciplines. Uh, so uh, this is really um, uh, just uh, for information uh, for people who are interested in construction management. Uh, and we are particularly interested in construction that goes also beyond just the on-site production to include also the entire range of construction services. What is also very interesting is that uh, we are uh, very uh, uh, interested in papers that have a strong theoretical positioning uh, that do not just describe what goes on in practice, but also offer a critical and reflexive account. of what goes on in practice so anyway this is just the aims and scope of uh, cme the types of papers that we uh, accept uh, includes a broad range 
Uh, so we certainly welcome papers that report on primary research. Uh, increasingly, we are also very interested in critical review papers uh, because we think that uh, as a field mature, uh, as a field matures, then we have a lot of uh, primary research and therefore uh, such fields uh, should also be uh, subject to critical reviews where we look at uh, previous research uh, on particular topic areas, uh, and then we can also interrogate the strengths and the weaknesses of uh, the evidence that's published uh, in previous research. We also think that critical review papers, uh, also if they are written well, can provide the basis for future uh, research. Uh, so we also look to critical review uh, papers to identify uh, areas for future research uh, perhaps directions for future research questions, um, identification of knowledge gaps uh, that perhaps uh, existing uh, body of knowledge doesn't, uh, um, uh, has not really tackled. Uh, we are also very interested in uh, policy reviews, uh, particularly nowadays, uh, uh, and certainly in our field, construction is pretty much also um, influenced by uh, various policies, uh, maybe policies relating to uh, how we build uh, buildings, uh, to building materials, but also policies in areas such as sustainable development and uh, our climate change uh, uh, actions as well. So we are very interested in perhaps uh, reviewing policies and uh, to see how they influence what we do. Uh, research notes, critical essays, uh, theory development papers, these are perhaps uh, submissions that we do not get an awful lot on, uh, but we are also very much uh, interested in uh, these types of papers. So maybe papers that are not uh, necessarily based on primary research, but perhaps uh, think pieces, so thought pieces that are really important. Uh, for example, at this moment, uh, we are also very interested in what is going to happen uh, after the COVID-19 uh, global pandemic. Will we actually change uh, our status quo and perhaps maybe we ought to also feature uh, essays and thought pieces around, the, uh, around this theme. Uh, book reviews and letters uh, are also welcomed in our journal. Um, so we are open to other kinds of papers too. Uh, so uh, recently we've also had suggestions to you publish short stories, maybe in dialogue conversations. Uh, and what I would say is that uh, journal editors are always trying to uh, be creative in terms of what we would like to accept. Uh, and so uh, as long as it makes a contribution to fundamental knowledge, uh, then we, we are very open to uh, uh, accepting uh, and welcoming papers of different types. Uh, a bit on the editorial team. So this is uh, the current editors. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, who actually uh, work with me to actually go through uh, the paper submissions. Uh, and we also handle the peer review process. Uh, we get the reviewers comments and then we then make an editorial decision. And to also support our decision making, we also have an extensive uh, editorial board uh, that's made up of members from across the world. Uh, and sometimes they also help us if we uh, have conflicting recommendations from reviewers. Uh, just some very key figures uh, to place where construction management and economics is in terms of the landscape of publishing in construction management. Uh, we are a first quartile journal uh, indexed in a number of areas uh, in the area of building and construction, industrial and manufacturing and engineering, and also because we are very much into information modeling, uh, we are also indexed as a first quartile uh, journal in management information systems. And what this means is in these uh, different areas, uh, we are sort of rated as the top 25% of all the uh, journals that are indexed within these areas. Therefore, you can see also that uh, this is one measure of the impact that we make because clearly uh, people are kind of citing this uh, in order to kind of make progress also in research in these particular areas. Uh, 
I've just had a look at the uh, statistics uh, and uh, generally over the last two years, on average, we handle about uh, over 500 manuscripts. Uh, so this is also what we did in the last uh, 12 months from 1st December last year to, uh, to today. And out of these 512 manuscripts, we made final decisions on 456 uh, submissions. And just to give you a rough idea that our average turnaround is uh, roughly 27 days. Uh, that doesn't mean that every manuscript that's submitted to us are turned around in that period of time. Uh, in fact, uh, desk rejections tend to uh, be turned around much quicker, sometimes within a few days. Um, and then those uh, that we think have the potential to be accepted, they tend to take longer uh, because actually it goes through the peer review process. And not only that, uh, uh, the number of days also uh, uh, factor in uh, the amount of days that the authors take uh, to kind of revise their manuscripts as well. So the average turnaround is just um, a, a rough indication. And out of the 456 uh, uh, papers that we made the final decision, uh, our acceptance rate is around 12%, and the rejects is about 80, uh, nearly 88%. Uh, this, I would say, is pretty much in line with a lot of journals that are perhaps in a similar quartile. So uh, I sometimes also uh, sit and meet the editor's session uh, and also uh, uh, listen to other editors from maybe uh, organizational and management studies. Uh, and I would say that the acceptance rate is pretty much uh, quite similar. Okay, what I'm going to share with you now uh, is really the uh, substance of uh, the talk I have planned today. And this is also based on the editorial piece that I wrote uh, when I became editor in January uh, 2020. Uh, so you can go and look at volume 38, issue one, that was published uh, in January 2020. Uh, and within that, you will also be able to read my reflections. Uh, before this, I was also the associate editor for the journal, so I reflected on my last six years before I became the editor-in-chief. And I'm just going to maybe summarize some of the key points uh, for you. So first of all, some of the common reasons for rejecting uh, papers. The first thing is that uh, nowadays, we tend not to simply accept papers that offer uh, a report from a particular country. Maybe about 20 years ago, 20, 30 years ago, it was quite common uh, to kind of see papers that simply report on what's going on in Sri Lanka, for example. Uh, and uh, sometimes the arguments that authors make is that there are many studies on this topic, but maybe this has not been studied in a particular country. Uh, for us, this is not necessarily a strong enough uh, argument uh, for us to warrant publication, because it really doesn't push uh, fundamental science. So for us, really what is uh, very important is that uh, it's important for us that the uh, papers that we accept uh, also make a contribution to fundamental science, and it's not just uh, simply another case study from uh, a different country. Uh, questionnaire surveys on factors, drivers, barriers, opportunities, and challenges. Uh, these types of papers also tend not to be uh, accepted in uh, the peer review process, uh, simply because we receive actually quite a lot of these types of papers. I would say maybe a rough estimate, we would receive uh, probably over 300 of such papers every year. And uh, these types of papers uh, generally tend to have conclusions that are pretty similar to one another. And therefore, this raises a question as to actually what is significantly novel in terms of uh, pushing fundamental science. So generally, we don't uh, tend to uh, look favorably upon uh, these types of uh, uh, questionnaire survey type uh, research, because we think that they make a really interesting market poll uh, but they don't generally uh, uh, sort of say anything that would change uh, fundamental thinking on particular topics. Um, earlier on, I mentioned that we really like critical reviews, uh, but what we don't generally like is just simply uh, literature reviews that are simply summarizing 
key factors from past research. Because for us, a good critical review should really critically analyze past questions, theoretical assumptions, methods, and findings. So that we can also say, this is what we know collectively about a particular topic. And actually, this is what we don't know about a particular topic. Therefore, if you simply summarize key factors and variables, then you're not really going to tell us anything new that we don't already necessarily know. So for us, a good critical review should really conclude with very substantive uh, questions for future research, uh, either questions or propositions or maybe even hypotheses for future research. Um, and so just generally, uh, uh, these are the reasons why we uh, re reject such papers, because we feel that these approaches generally do not really make a difference. Uh, and therefore, that means it doesn't really leave an impact, whether that's academically or also for industry practice. So I want to share with you some definitions of what impacts uh, uh, mean to us. Uh, this is taken from uh, an article, a very recent article from Research Policy. Um, as, as you may be aware, and perhaps maybe also in Sri Lanka, that there is a drive towards demonstrating impacts of research. Uh, but certainly in the US, in uh, the UK, also across Europe, in Australia, uh, also in places like China, etc., uh, we are increasingly having to demonstrate as academics the uh, differences that we make uh, through our research. And so within the impacts agenda, there are quite a number of uh, key definitions that might be uh, quite uh, useful to reflect on. So the first one is that impacts are demonstrable or perceptible benefits uh, that ranges uh, for individuals, uh, groups, organizations, society. And that can also have a link uh, perhaps with research. And here maybe it's worth thinking about two uh, other categories. How significant uh, is the difference that you are making? So what is the magnitude of the effect of your research? And are you also reaching out to a diverse group of people? So uh, generally nowadays, we also see the increase uh, in a lot of a lot, uh, interdisciplinary work and therefore, what happens in one disciplinary uh, field uh, would also have uh, an impact perhaps on another disciplinary field. And so, you know, the more diverse you can reach out to uh, other fields perhaps, uh, then maybe you are also extending the reach of your research impacts. So I think it's kind of worth reflecting on both the significance of the message. So to what extent are you actually making a difference to our fundamental thinking, but also, uh, not just to our field, but perhaps to other fields as well, in terms of extending the reach. Okay, and of course, citations is only one type of impact. Uh, in an applied field like construction, uh, it would be also very nice to see that the research is also cited, uh, perhaps in policy or practice. And this is also where sometimes we see a lot of modeling work, but these papers don't get cited or they don't get picked up by practitioners. So you often wonder whether the models are really generating something that is significant. Uh, because in our view, I think if it's significant, then they would generally be used also by practitioners or cited in policy as well. So citations is only one type of impact, but it does also give us some ideas of how it is uh, being used uh, in, uh, by others. By the way, a word of caution, and it's also why I highlighted citations in red, because sometimes you might also find that uh, a particular research article is also cited because of criticisms. So it's also very important not just to look at the quantitative measure of citations, but also to figure out how uh, the particular research is being cited. Uh, because you can generate a lot of citations if also it attracts a lot of criticisms as well. Okay, in what I'm going to do now, I'm going to uh, take you through a typical logic of an article. 
because I think it's really important that we understand how the article is built up and also where we can put uh, statements that uh, really emphasize the significance and perhaps also even the reach of what we do in our research. Um, so I'm going to share with you a model because a typical research article looks very familiar. You often see these three boxes and the three boxes uh, represent firstly the title. And a good title uh, should share with the uh, audience uh, three main things. So what is the purpose of the paper? So the intent, what is contained in the paper and also what is the scope of the paper? So this is also usually a very short uh, line of text, typically eight to 20 words, but you have to contain a lot of this information. What is the intent? What is contained in the paper? And the scope is what is not contained in the paper. So what are the boundaries? And then the second box, of course, is the author. And the author line is also really quite important because generally authors represent a line of authority, so an authoritative way of thinking. So very often we can uh, see who the authors are and pretty much figure out what on earth they are trying to argue in this paper. Uh, and then of course we have the abstract and generally the abstract summarizes the aim, method and key finding. Uh, and these are the places where you already start to uh, uh, highlight the contribution uh, and the impacts also of your, of your research. Now, typically you would see the keywords under the abstract, but of course the keywords should also be indicated in the title because nowadays when we search for papers, uh, we typically search using keywords and the first thing we tend to see is also the title. So that I think is quite important. Now I'm going to take you through the main body of the research paper. And uh, we like to use an hourglass uh, to kind of um, represent the logic of the research article because uh, it's split into two halves, what we call the front end, uh, where we move from the broad to the specific, from the general to the specific. And then we move to the back end, which is the specific to the general. And in, in our experience as editors and also as reviewers, generally what happens is that the front end and the back end are the two areas that really result in a lot of corrections. I will explain why in a minute. Now, there are different parts to the article. Now, I'm not using these as section headings, but these are different parts. I will explain why in a, min uh, in a minute. So the first part is the introduction. This is not the introduction section, but this is generally the introduction that also includes the review of previous studies. And then we have the theory and method, the results and the discussion and conclusions. Now, generally, a lot of authors are very good at describing their theory method and also reporting on the results but it is actually contextualizing their study against previous studies. That is usually the point uh, that really needs a lot of attention. Uh, now this structure follows pretty much the Imrat model. And I'm going to take you through the different parts from front end to back end, just to share with you also the different cues that are I think quite important. But before I go there, uh, I would say that uh, I can imagine that when we read a paper, most of us probably start with the title. Maybe we read the abstract. And if we find that quite interesting, maybe we read a bit about the introduction before we go to the conclusions. I guess quite a lot of people do that. And what I'm going to suggest is that if you jump to conclusions, remember, we should never jump to conclusions, but when we read papers, sometimes we do jump to conclusions. When we jump to conclusions, then I think we miss really important information. So what I'm going to show you uh, is actually what are really the important 
bits of information that is uh, that we need to pay attention to. So let's maybe start with the beginning of a research article. Now, if I ask you, what, how do papers usually start? Then people start to search in their memory uh, how papers usually start. And I often say, well, it starts almost like a fairy tale. If we think of fairy tales, fairy tales often start in one of two ways. You either start with once upon a time or in a land far, far away. Right. So in a fairy tale, you have a time stamp once upon a time or a space stamp in a land far, far away. And in journal papers, we also have that time stamp or space stamp. In journal papers, we have stamps uh, uh, signifying words like recently. So that's the once upon a time. Recently, nowadays, over the last 10 years. Yeah, so papers often start like that. Or you could have a space stamp globally in Sri Lanka. You know, so you might also have a space stamp, and that's usually followed by a statement that reads something like, there has been growing interest in something. Now, this is a really important statement that sometimes we don't pay much attention to. And it is important because we have so many papers to read nowadays that we are also trying to get the attention of the readers. So if you don't capture or you, if you don't hook the reader into your paper, right at the beginning through the title, abstract and the first line, uh, then they are probably not going to read the paper. And that's why we are often very good as academics to say we have a problem, but this problem is a growing problem. So we always want to drum up interest in the problem. Okay. Now, there has been growing interest in something. How you label that something will determine also how you connect with relevant people uh, in the academic world. Because the way you name the research problem will also then, uh, uh, how, how do I say, will also influence what you include and what you exclude when you cite other uh, uh, papers. So if you then start with, recently there has been growing interest in something, then what follows is that we then start to see a lot of citations. So De Jong did this, De Vries did that, Van Dijk did the other. And this is the part which also editors and reviewers pay a lot of attention. Uh, by the way, those of you who are doing a PhD study, uh, this is also what the examiners look out for. Because we want to know whether you have really captured uh, the essence of the body of knowledge. And this is also the part that a lot of people tend to summarize. But remember, a review is not a summary because otherwise we will call it a literature summary. A review is never a summary. Very often, you know, we have a lot of summaries and then the reader reads, it goes, yeah, De Jong did this, De Vries did that, Van Dijk, blah, 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 blah. And at the end of a few thousand words later, the reader is wondering, why did I read this? And I'm sure as an author, when you write all these thousands of words, you're also wondering, why did I waste my time writing that? Indeed, the review is not a summary, uh, because at the end of the review, there is usually something that is very powerful. It's a very powerful word that sometimes we don't pay a lot of attention to. And that word is the word however. So I want you to also reflect on the way you write uh, papers. How many times do we use the word however? If we use the word however many times, then we get very confused because the word however is really powerful. If you use it once, it means that De Jong did this, De Vries did that, Van Dijk did that, everybody did all these things. However, this is what we know. However, this is what we don't know. 
So the word, however, if you use only once, is a very powerful indicator word for you to demonstrate your argument. By the way, this is only one approach. Huh? This is only one approach uh, uh, to formulate or to frame your research. Um, it, it, it's the most common approach. Normally we say, this is what we know. However, this is what we don't know. And that's an argument. We are trying to argue, what is the research question? And why is this research question so important? So I'm going to give you an example now. Okay, globally, there is a growing problem over why there are so few women working in construction. So we reviewed a lot of studies. After reviewing a lot of studies, we realized that most studies tend to be done by women, with women, for women. However, what is overlooked is the men's point of view about this problem. So you can see when I start to formulate this argument, uh, at the moment I cannot see your facial expression, but I can imagine that maybe some of you are thinking, okay, this is interesting. You may not agree with me that to understand the problem of women underrepresentation in construction, you may not agree that we should speak to men, but nevertheless, I'm sure you may have thought well, this is quite an interesting question. And that is really the impact that you want to leave on your reader. You want to generate a reaction as the reader is reading. Aha, so many studies have looked at this. However, they didn't look at that and that's it. That's the, uh, that's the hook that you need. Once you have the research question, so in this example, the research question is, what do men think about the women under representation in construction? By the way, if I go back a step, the intent and the content, the purpose is to figure out men's point of view about women, and the scope is women under representation in construction. So I'm not looking at all different sectors, I'm just looking at construction. So that's an example of how I have the intent, content, and the scope. But nevertheless, so I have a research question, I justify what it is and why is this important. Once I have the research question, then I start to describe and justify the theory and method. And then I, this is really the how, how did I answer the question? And why did I answer? Uh, how, why did I do what I did to answer the question in this way? And then the results is simply to report what the men tell me. So in the middle is the most narrowest focus. It's not the least uh, word count, uh, but it's the narrowest focus. Now, I noticed that there is a question uh, maybe here. Okay, uh, so if you have a question, you can use the Q&A function. Now, one of the things that I discovered in my research was that the things that were stopping women from coming into engineering or construction were also the things that were stopping men from coming into construction. So for example, long working hours, working away from home, these were the things that also affected men from coming into construction. Now, the question I have for you is, therefore, can I conclude that men and women are equal? Well, maybe after some reflection, you probably think, well, maybe you can't. Maybe that's not something you can conclude. And indeed, at the end of the paper, at the end of every paper, there is always a very famous sentence. Almost every paper has this sentence. And that paper is, there is always room for further research. That's why the front end is taking what we know. So if you think about the logic, what we know to what we don't know, however. And then the results answer the question of what we don't know. 
And then the back end broadens out again. It expands. It tells us what else do we not know. And so I found really interesting things that suggest that men and women are not so different. Maybe this is scope for future research. So in the discussion and conclusions, you are also creating an argument and that argument is, so what? What else do I need to pay attention to? Can you see that? Now, also in the conclusions, you will often find words like maybe, perhaps, and probably, which is really strange because these words are not very conclusive. But you really have to say, well, maybe men and women are not so different. Let's do further research. You very often do not see the words maybe, perhaps, probably here, because you move from what we know to what we don't know. So you cannot start a paper by saying, recently, maybe there is climate change. Because if you use the word maybe, then it feels very uncertain. And that's why in the introduction, you are always more assertive. But every research uh, uh, project always, uh, every research project has limitations. That's why you have to say, well, maybe we haven't found everything. So there's room for further research. I hope you find this model quite uh, useful because it also then gives you some indication of actually the logic of all the statements. And by the way, notice that I've highlighted these different parts because I think these are also the different parts where you start to connect with previous studies, okay? Uh, if I have time, maybe later on we can take questions around citations, because I think this is also quite important. Now, the reason why it's important to connect your study with previous studies is because academic papers do not stand alone. We usually read papers as a chain of conversation. So most of you, when you first start, uh, start to read papers on a particular topic, you may find that uh, the more you read, the more confused you get. And that is quite normal because you are getting confused because you are trying to figure out what are the previous conversations that people are having? What are the jargons? What are the terminology? Because if you go to different fields, they may use the same word to mean different things. So you are trying to figure out, okay, what are the previous conversations? And that is what you do in the front end. I always find writing the review of previous studies the most difficult part of any paper, because every time you have to create a new however, a new argument. And, and so how you use previous studies, I think that is also really important. And that also, by the way, gives you your impact, because by connecting with relevant conversations, you are also inviting them uh, to your space because at the end, you want to invite future conversations. So in my women and men study, to put it simply, I was engaging with previous studies that were done a lot by women, but I took a different approach. I say, okay, I want to know what men think. And nowadays, people who are then interested in what men think, they would then cite my study. So I'm also inviting future conversations. And of course, in the middle, it is your particular study. It's your contribution to the conversation. And that is also why we do not jump to conclusions. Because if you jump to conclusions, you miss already the middle part, which is the important part of the study. So I want to reiterate again. In the front end, we start with what do we know? We get to the however statement, which is what do we not know? And then we move to what did you do to find out the answers to what we do not know? And in the end, you want to figure out what else do we still not know? Okay, I hope this was useful for you. 
Um, in the paper, I've elaborated a lot more, so I'm going to leave also uh, the uh, web link. Uh, but I've also kind of uh, identified, you know, uh, some questions that, you know, might help you when you start developing your paper as well. Okay, and I think this also applies to uh, not just construction management and economics. So in other journals, I think uh, this type of approach would also apply. I want to uh, move a bit uh, towards uh, this idea of theoretical contribution. What it is and why is it important? This is becoming quite important because, as I've mentioned, if you look at journals that are in the high impact area, they tend to be the ones that are actually making a fundamental difference to thinking. So theory and thinking is basically, uh, for me, synonymous. Uh, here, I would like to cite uh, a, uh, an editorial piece by Muller and Klein on what constitutes a contemporary contribution to uh, the field of project management. And here, uh, it's interesting and simultaneously links to existing knowledge. So again, remember, uh, connecting with previous conversations is important. Relationship between variables, we get a lot of that. We have a lot of success factors, papers, or enablers, drivers, but they don't generally tend to uh, feature very well. It's actually trying to explore the relationships between the variables that are more interesting. Uh, complex descriptions, etc. But the three that I would like to highlight is actually in the end, uh, it goes back to theories. So are we testing existing theories or perhaps testing the boundary conditions of these theories? Or are we also extending existing theories. And maybe I could add, are we also building new theories? Uh, I think maybe that's something we also ought to aspire uh, towards. So three constituent parts of theory, let's say, uh, this is also taken from the paper. There is the what question, and generally in, in our field at least, there's a lot of interest in variables, concepts, and factors at a very basic level. But actually, Answering the what question is, at least from my point of view, not uh, uh, strong enough as a theoretical contribution, because then what is more interesting is how do they relate? So what are the relationships between the variables? So the how question, but also the reasons behind the relationships. And from my point of view, the how and the why really underpins uh, actually the pushing the frontiers of our understanding. Okay, so theory, I think, is, uh, is that. Now, the other thing I would like to share with you is also drawing inspiration from design research. So I'm in Technical University of Delft, uh, and in Delft, we are also very proud of our design tradition, and designers generally also uh, are trying to figure out the relationship with research. And to me, I thought this is a really nice way of looking at the world, because indeed, we could either start with fundamental science. This is the standard, the typical way in which we uh, start a scientific research project. So we go into the literature, we read about the literature, we figure out, okay, we think about it, and we figure out where is our theoretical point of difference. So we think first. But then sometimes designers are also not uh, thinking first, maybe they see first or do first. So sometimes maybe they want to produce the artifact. And that's why in our fields in construction, for example, there's so many of us who are interested in, let's develop a model first and then see actually what uh, it does or doesn't do. So maybe sometimes we create the artifact first, a model, an artifact uh, or component, or maybe we see first, so somewhere in between thinking and doing. Um, so I think we do have quite a diversity of approaches, but in the end, you still need to connect what you actually produce in practice with the kind of fundamental uh, science. Okay, um, I also want to draw your attention to this uh, rather old paper now about 15 years ago by Stephen Barley called When I Write My Masterpiece. And so Bali also said that there are three, at least three ways in which you can uh, make a fundamental contribution. 
One is that you make a theoretical contribution. So maybe you are challenging our existing assumptions or the ways of thinking about something. I will give you a few examples in a bit. Maybe you are also creating a methodological contribution. You are using a fresh method uh, to, to uh, address an old problem. So maybe it's a new way of collecting and analyzing data. Nowadays, also with uh, machine learning, with uh, sort of, uh, you, you, might, you might have uh, quite a lot of very interesting ways of uh, creating new methods. And maybe you might uh, create subject matter contributions. So this is also something that uh, in our journal we are very interested in. You know, so maybe we have been looking at the productivity challenge for a long time. Uh, is there a new way to create new insights on productivity, particularly maybe reflecting on what's happening with the pandemic uh, or technological change, for example? Okay. I said I was going to give you some examples of how we uh, uh, challenge fundamental thinking. So here's an example. So uh, in this particular book, Sorting Things Out, uh, the authors actually talk about the word infrastructure. And when we think about infrastructure, we normally think about roads, bridges, railway lines, airports, etc. Usually we think about what is infrastructure. Or maybe in our field, we are also interested in how we build that infrastructure, right? So these are generally the questions that we uh, think about. But these authors said, maybe those are not the right questions. Maybe the appropriate question to ask is when is infrastructure? So this doesn't sound very uh, right, you know, because normally we say, what is infrastructure and how do we build infrastructure? It feels a bit odd, strange to say, when is infrastructure? And in the book, they made a, a really good compelling argument to say that we can only know what is infrastructure when infrastructure breaks down. So when infrastructure is uh, functioning well, like now I'm talking to you using this video call and everything seems to be functioning well, we don't actually see the infrastructure. But let us say that maybe the video call is not working well and suddenly I'm frozen or maybe there is an error message. So that's also when we start to see infrastructure and that's also when we start to see the really interesting variables and relationships uh, between the variables that we can do something about. So they gave us this question, when is infrastructure? So it really challenges the way we think about things. Another two recent examples uh, have been written by these authors uh, who actually went back to history. I'm sure all of you have heard of Maslow's hierarchy of needs uh, when it comes to motivation. And maybe you have also heard of Kurt Lewin's uh, uh, model of change management, where first of all, you have to unfreeze, change, and then refreeze. And then of course, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is the basic needs all the way to self-actualization. Now, what these authors did was they went back to history, the historical records, to figure out whether or not Maslow really created a pyramid of needs and whether Kurt Lewin also generated the three steps of change management. And they found through historical analysis that Maslow never actually illustrated the hierarchy of needs. In fact, everybody cites the 1943 paper by Abraham Maslow. And in actual fact, he never had a hierarchy of needs in that paper. And Lewin also never developed the three-step process of change management. So this really disrupts the way we currently think about things. Okay, so uh, my second last slide now, and then I will wrap up uh, so that we have some time for discussion. Uh, so in order to generate uh, impacts on fundamental science, increasingly high quality journals place a lot of emphasis on theoretical contribution. And by that, what we mean is that, are you challenging existing assumptions and ways of thinking? Think about my Maslow, think about my uh, infrastructure example. And it's not just about the what and the how, but 
More importantly, theoretical contributions also address why things happen, the reasons behind it. It raises often interesting and counterintuitive questions and not just a list of positively linked factors. So very often we get papers that formulates hypotheses that factor A will positively associate with B. And everything is positively associated. And for us, that is not surprising enough. It feels almost like unsurprising and pretty expected. Uh, so we really want to see, okay, what is counterintuitive? So it's really important also to pay attention to the front end and the back end, because that's where you connect with previous conversations in past research. So my closing thoughts now. It's really important that you start thinking, why is your research interesting? Remember, recently there is growing interest in something. That statement sounds really innocent, but it's actually trying to persuade the reader that this is really interesting and important. And also to start thinking, how have you made a difference to existing conversations? Think about your however statement. What is your however statement? Because in the however statement, you can actually already show your point and the counterpoints, right? So how your study is positioned against previous studies. So have you challenged current thinking or methods, for example? Are you challenging current practice? Have you challenged current policy? And can you also elaborate on these in the discussion of your findings? And perhaps also we need to pay attention as usual to the front end and the back end. Um, this is just maybe some forthcoming special issues to look out for those of you who are interested in our field. Uh, they will, a lot of these will be published in 2022. And with that, I think I'm going to stop sharing and uh, open up uh, also to questions. Okay, there is a question about self-citations. Yes, in fact, uh, you self-citations are not really good practice uh, because actually you really want to connect with previous conversations. Uh, but it's also field dependent because also it depends on what types of fields you are in. Uh, in, in particularly engineering fields uh, where you know certain groups are very well known for doing certain things, then they tend to cite also what their groups do. Uh, but generally in the fields like our, our field, then uh, self-citations are, uh, and in fact, in these indices, uh, they do also uh, remove, you know, as you've mentioned, also this uh, SNP index, for example. Uh, is it always necessary to look for indices? My question is definitely not. In fact, in the Netherlands now, we are forbidden to actually uh, write our uh, H index. When we apply for jobs or when we apply for research funding, we cannot say how what is our H index. For me, it is really important to figure out why do you submit to that journal? Is it because they are more suitable for the conversations that you want to have? So I think that connects with Ashan's uh, uh, question. Uh, it really depends on the conversation. So the subject related contributions really has something to do with what conversations you think you are going to connect with. And that's uh, based on your review of previous studies. Maybe I pause for a bit. Kalindu and Udayangani. I don't know if uh, that was okay for now. Thank you, Professor Paul, for that informative session. But there's, there's one more 
question on the question and actually two. Uh, shall I read them out, sir? Yeah, I, I was just reading that. Uh, there are different views indeed. And uh, I don't know what the situation is in Sri Lanka. I can imagine that people place quite a bit of emphasis on H index. Uh, but I think that then leads to rather perverse uh, behaviors. Uh, for me, I think it's really the kinds of conversation that you have. For example, there are many different journals that I can choose uh, on, uh, let's say, project management. Uh, for instance, you can have the European Journal, the International Journal of Project Management, you can have the American Journal Project Management Journal, or you could have the Journal of uh, International Journal of Managing Projects in Business, uh, the Australian Journal. Um, and, and for me, I think, you know, each of these journals have a slightly different flavor in the conversations. To my mind, the International Journal of Managing Projects in Business tend to also uh, welcome a lot of critical scholarship. So if I'm a critical scholar and I'm very interested in uh, having conversations in that space, then I also want to make sure that I submit to a journal where people are actually going to read uh, my, uh, um, uh, read the stuff. So for example, uh, maybe I will not put critical sc uh, scholarship in uh, papers that in journals that are much more engineering management focused, because actually they may have a high H uh, impact factor. So remember, the impact factor of a journal is not the same as the impact factor of the paper. So you could actually be in an, a high impact factor journal, but nobody reads your paper. Uh, and ultimately, really what you want to do is you want people to read your paper and then to actually cite it. And they will only cite it if they think that you are going to add to their conversation. So there are also quite some papers in very high impact journals that don't get cited. And you don't really want to be in that position. Uh, so I would actually really advise people to figure out, okay, why did I choose this journal? So one of the things that I often advise PhDs is, okay, which journal do you cite most in, for your PhD? And why did you cite them? Are you trying to add something to the conversations in that journal? And I think that that is far more important because if you are actually connecting to those, those conversations, then you will attract more readership and hopefully more citations and your individual H in, uh, impact factor would increase, right? Rather than the journal's impact factor, I guess. The second question on what we know, and I think this also kind of connects with uh, Ashan's point about you know, subject matter uh, contribution, because actually in the end, you need to know exactly what the conversation is about. Um, and so if you only read the literature simply to identify factors and variables, then you are not connecting with the conversation. Uh, to me, I think in the world, there are seven questions, right? who, what, where, when, why, how, so what. And so it might be really interesting to trace how thinking about a particular topic has changed over time, right? Maybe we thought about, uh, well, for instance, yesterday I taught uh, uh, my students innovation management. And I sort of said, well, in the early days, we thought of innovation uh, from uh, a kind of science push perspective, and then we move towards an end user demand pool perspective. So you see there are these different perspectives that you can uh, start to form a narrative, a storyline. So Raja Ratnam also says that what we know and what we do not know is a critical part of an early career researcher and often we hang on the shoulders of these key authors to explore what we currently know. If it is a quantitative experimental output, high chances of acceptability? No, not necessarily. I would say that uh, in our journal, qualitative research actually stands a higher chance. Uh, quantitative papers actually have a higher rejection rate. Uh, we just don't get enough of qualitative research. So they actually stand a higher chance. Uh, so what I would say is that maybe because people have this assumption 
that quantitative research gets accepted more. So then maybe that's why they don't write qualitative papers. So actually for the few qualitative papers that we get, uh, we actually accept a lot more of those. Um, and I'll give another example, for instance. In, uh, uh, for instance, uh, I worked with a colleague uh, to develop these writing courses. And she used to also uh, work with colleagues in automotive uh, safety. And also in, uh, in, in that particular field, you know, for a long time, the experimental, sci uh, uh, experimental scientists did not regard simulation as a good method. So you used to have these two camps, right? But over time, the simulation people managed to convince, right? So remember, Sometimes the contribution is also takes a bit of time. So you need a bit of time to create a critical mass. And that's why we go to conferences, because from the conferences, we start to build that critical mass. And from conferences, then we have special issues. And usually special issues is trying to highlight, hey, we know so much about experimental work, but actually if we keep doing experiments, we're not going to get further. Maybe let's look at simulation, because after all, when we talk about automotive uh, safety, we cannot do experiments that kill people, right? So maybe we want to also do uh, some sort of computer simulation. And now, of course, computing power is so much stronger, uh, quicker, more powerful, that maybe allows us to do these simulations. So Rajaratnam, my answer to your question, as well as to Ashan, is indeed to try to figure out what we know and to also create an argument to convince those people who may not agree with you. By the way, that's the purpose of the peer review process. The peer review process is actually also a dialogue, a conversation. It's a conversation between the reviewers, the editors, and the authors. And sometimes uh, editors don't just go with a, re a recommendation of reject. Uh, because we maybe can see some value in trying to uh, disrupt uh, current thinking. Uh, because if we just go with reject, uh, then we'll simply reject every uh, paper. Um, sometimes we also need to change the ways we think about things. And so what I would say is that in this particular example, uh, qualitative research can really sometimes offer answers that quantitative uh, research cannot. Um, so, for instance, quantitative maybe focus a lot on the how, the uh, the well, maybe more on the what and to what extent, whereas the qualitative research maybe deepens our understanding of how and why. So maybe they address different questions. I don't know if uh, that was okay. It's important to generalize findings. Okay, well, can I say that rather than to use the word generalize, because actually sometimes it is not about generalizing, but it's about contextualizing your findings in relation to previous studies. And that is really important uh, because you want to contextualize your findings. And this is usually where we have a lot of major revisions. Um, yeah. I think that's also important. Yeah, because sometimes if you do a single case study, then you really can't generalize. But nevertheless, you should still contextualize to general thinking about the topic. I think we, we have no more questions. Uh... Yes. So once again, I would like to extend my gratitude to Professor Dr. Paul Chan uh, for accepting our invitation and uh, despite of his busy schedule uh, and allocating time to do this wonderful but insightful uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, on behalf of the organizing committee, I extend our dearest gratitude, gratitude to you. Okay. With that, uh, we have come to the end of the session and uh, end of the first day of the research week. Uh, hope you will join with us in the next days as well. Uh, hope to see you soon.
again tomorrow. With that, uh, we will end the first day of this worksheet. Stay safe. Have a great day.